The best games out there don't make you guess at what they are. If you can read the title on a box and not immediately know what you're going to be doing, then is it really a good game? Every masterpiece in the industry has shared this important trait. Minecraft. Temple Run. Farming Simulator 2013. If you pick up any of these at GameStop, you can rest assured that your purchase is a wise one. Conversely, any game that doesn't share in this simple but genius naming scheme tends to suck really bad. Destiny 2. Overwatch. Red Dead Redemption. 2. Who's Red? How did he die? Why are you redeeming him a second time? Do not in contrast, when I see the timeless classic Saddam Hussein Simulator, I'm already hyped for the Bricks and Rubble. The Vented Fan or DLC, though. The point, if indeed one could be drawn, is that games with simple and self-descriptive names are always good, and games that don't are always bad, 100% of the time. Trade Lands is one such game. I absolutely no life this game from 2015 to 2019, and over the course of those years, I've seen rulers come and go, nations rise and fall, ships be added and removed, and everybody being stretched into Arthro abominations. It's safe to say that Trade Lands has always held a special place in my heart. I honestly forgot why, but back in like November, I decided to check on the game to see how it was doing, and got sucked right back into the loop. This game is awesome, and in this video we're going to talk about why. So the premise of Trade Lands is pretty straightforward. You live in the Grand Isles, a vast archipelago of small nations in the Age of Sail. You can choose to stay on your home island and labor away, gathering resources to sell to richer players, or you can take destiny into your own hands, build yourself a trusty vessel, and etch your name to the history of the Grand Isles. There are three main ways to make a living in Trade Lands. The first and most obvious is trading cargo. Hop in your ship, load it up with goods and commodities from one island, and sell it all for a profit at another. The amount of money you make per sale is influenced by the number of pirates in the server and the demand for each product. If the whole server is shipping cocoa and paper from Whitecrest to Nova, then the demand for those cargoes in Nova is going to drop, taking the sell price along with it. Most people agree that the best general trade route is Nassau, Salem, Harrisburg, Nassau, or the reverse depending on the wind direction. Players need to be constantly vigilant for unwelcome company. Piratus Black Windus, commonly known as the Grand Isles Pirate, is an opportunistic predator that inhabits the same waters as the trader, and it would attack and rob the latter in a heartbeat if it thought there was even a sliver of a chance of success. There are two primary methods to deal with pirates. The first is simply outrunning them. They can't steal from who they can't catch. The main downside to this method is that fast ships tend to have less cargo space, which leaves us with the alternative strategy, trading in a ship that has enough HP and firepower that can hold its own against anything the pirates throw at it. The big issue with this one is that you need people to crew all those guns, and it can be a hassle to find people willing to sail with you. It follows, then, that the second most popular form of income is piracy. Stealing other people's cargo rather than trading it yourself has some distinct benefits. Firstly, you don't have to sink the same amount of time and risk traveling from point A to point B. All you gotta do is intercept a trader somewhere in between and then reap the rewards. Secondly, there's a considerable bonus for selling cargo that was stolen, so you'd make more money even if you traveled the same distance. Finally, piracy is just more fun than trading. It might take a while to find and stalk an ideal target, but once you do board and raid a trader, it's a hundred times more exciting than the monotonous slog of sailing in a straight line from port to port all day. Pirates aren't the only ones who can steal cargo, though. A member of any faction can steal cargo from someone in opposing faction. If a Nassau privateer spots a Blackwind trader, they can raid it and enjoy all the same benefits that come with selling stolen cargo. Finally, some people choose to become merchants and middlemen in the player-driven economy, buying, selling, and trading raw materials, rare resources, artisan weapons, and more. These people often run their businesses out of public houses that they've converted into storefronts and display areas to hawk their wares. Transactions made here can range from buying a couple hundred ash wood in bulk to acquiring rare collectibles worth millions. These shopkeepers and businessmen tend to be high-level, end-game players who've basically done everything else there is to do. You'll often see them advertising the custom weapons they've made or the rare materials they're selling in the chat. Trade Lands is a grindy game, as we'll come to find, and the amount of grinding required to get here would make the most shameless e-thought blush. There are currently more than 50 different ships in Trade Lands. Sloops, barks, schooners, catches, brigs, flutes, galleons, and more sail around the Grand Isles trading, raiding, and fighting it out on the high seas. Each level brings access to bigger and better ships, and over the course of your Trade Lands career you can improve from a tiny sparrow to a towering ornate gargoyle, or an imposing Neptune-class ironclad. While they come in many different shapes and sizes, the ships in Trade Lands mostly boil down to a couple of key stats. Sail speed is pretty straightforward. It determines the maximum speed you'll travel under ideal wind conditions. 
Sail plan is a bit more complicated, but no less important. Ships with square rigged sails go fastest when they're directly downwind, but they suffer a lot when sailing crosswind. Ships with fore and aft sails perform better crosswind, but not as well downwind. Ships with junk and lateen rigs can sail better crosswind and catch the wind better in general, respectively. Some ships have a combination of square and fore and aft sails, so they can be used in all kinds of situations. Cargo capacity is pretty self-explanatory. Ships that carry more cargo are able to trade in higher volumes, as well as steal more from victims as a pirate. Finally, armament refers to the amount, size, and placement of cannons on the ship. Cannons come in light, medium, and heavy sizes. Carronades are cheaper to make and do more damage for their size, but they have reduced range compared to long guns. Mortars do the most damage, but only a couple ships can mount them and they're much more difficult to use. Cannons that protrude from the bow or stern of a ship are called chasers. They tend to be smaller than broadside cannons and have the ability to periodically shoot slowing rounds, which reduce the speed of a target for 15 seconds. This can give either party the edge in a pursuit, especially if both ships have the same sail speed. I always like to have a fast pirate ship that I can use to intercept and rob merchants, currently my Corsair, a high volume trading ship that yields a decent amount of passive income, as of now my Gargoyle, and a durable battleship that's tanky enough to do combat missions and slug it out with any enemies that try to blockade a harbor. This is also my Gargoyle, but in its base configuration with heavy cannons. The last thing I'll say about ships is this. Do your research before you settle on building a new one. If you choose poorly, then you'll have sunk a ton of time and resources into a ship that probably isn't going to turn a profit for a long while. Here's a list of good trading and pirate ships that are a pretty safe bet up to level 10. So we've got all these ships and weapons to make. How do we go about that? Well, this is where everyone's main issue with Trade Lands rears its ugly head. It is one of the most grindy games I've ever experienced. Simultaneously, it's also one of the most Robux hungry. It's funny to walk around the game and ask players if they think Nara's greedy and get a yes every single time. For example, of the 30 medals listed on the Trade Lands wiki, only 15 of them can be obtained without using Robux. I wouldn't have so much of a problem with this if premium materials only affected items' aesthetic value, but weapons made from these materials are objectively better than those made from vanilla ones. They can have more durability, do more damage, and inflict special status effects like burning or stamina drain. People who pay Robux to get these powerful items will always have an advantage over people who don't, which doesn't sit right with me. If you do want to grind for vanilla materials, it takes forever and there's a limit to the amount of resources you can gather per week. One way to get around the issue of premium materials is the player-driven economy. Doubloons are a universal currency, and a wealthy enough vanilla player can purchase all manner of premium items from those who already have them. This goes for just about every type of commodity in the game except for ships and loyalty items, which are acquired through logging in every day. I used plain old doubloons to purchase this limited figurehead that went off sale years ago. This aspect of the game goes a long way toward blunting the pain of Tradeland's egregious monetization, but does little to reduce the vanilla grind. Another famous aspect of Trade Lands is its unique approach to lore. From a gameplay standpoint, things are pretty cut and dry. There are different factions that trade and fight across this collection of islands. Below the surface, the lore is being written in real time as actual players take part in official navy battles or send elected representatives to debate policy with both real and non-player factions. Usually, these activities don't cause much change in the base game. Maybe a non-spawn island now flies a different flag to signify its new ownership, or a Prashovian delegate auctions off some unique weapons and supplies to wealthy players. However, every once in a while, these lore events can have drastic consequences. To illustrate my point, I'm going to take you all on a journey through time, back to the year 2016. Back then, there were only three playable factions, the Kingdom of Whitecrest, the Blackwind Pirates, and the Verdantine Sovereignty. The Verds were located in a good geographic position, enjoyed favorable tax rates, and arguably had a more resource-rich and defensible home island than Whitecrest or the Pirates. Then, one day, a new faction arrived. The Werner Expedition, a ragtag crew of foreigners, got shipwrecked on a small, desolate island in the northern region of the map and built a small fort there. Before long, the Verdantine Sovereignty declared war on the expedition, who reached out to the Verd's historic rival, Whitecrest, for help. The kingdom came to their aid and successfully defeated the Verdantine Sovereignty, resulting in the complete destruction of the faction. Members of the Werner Expedition, now called Nova Balresca, took control of the Verdantine home island and banished the players who formerly lived there to that crappy little island in the north, now officially owned by Hallengard. This series of lore events that the vast majority of players never would have even heard about caused entire populations to be displaced and completely changed the status quo of the political landscape. Hey, editing skid here. I forgot to mention that Nassau and Hallengard have since been made into client states or just outright absorbed by Whitecrest and Nova, so the current territory map looks a lot more like this. 
I find this method of world building fascinating, and the fact that the fate of trade lands is decided by those players dedicated enough to their factions that they join their official navies makes it all the better. As the map expands and new nations that had previously only existed in the lore are added to the game, who knows what can happen. This is the part of the video where I talk about all the bullet points that weren't important enough to warrant their own chapters. Pirate glass, details, details you get the idea. Trade lands is a built-in feature that punishes players who reset or leave the game while in combat. If someone combat logs, they'll be put in jail for 5 minutes and given the combat logger title as a punishment. While this is a neat little mechanic, it can be a little overzealous when determining whether or not you're in combat. If your ship is damaged at any point, it tacks on 60 seconds of combat time. Even after you die, you have to wait for minutes and minutes as whoever killed you slowly sinks your ship halfway across the map. Even when the timer runs down to zero, it can still count you as being in combat for another minute or two. It's a bit inconsistent is all. Many items and resources are time sensitive. They might only come out during certain seasons, like ice replacing electro steel in the winter. Or they may only have one run and then become unavailable forevermore. Many popular ships, like the Badger, Atlas Line, and Demeter, are no longer buildable through the shipwright, meaning the ones that already exist are treated as trophies. I like the idea of new ship models passing in and out of the game, but I wish you could somehow trade them or transfer ownership to someone else. That way, these iconic vessels are less likely to fade into obscurity. I really enjoy the way that Trade Lands models its ships. They're all like miniature, simplified versions of real life vessels during the Age of Sail. I remember being proud after I built my Widgeon because I considered it to be a large ship. The models themselves tend to be appropriately proportioned and pleasing to the eye. The elegant lines of the barks and barkentines in the Beaver series, the tall, proud quarterdecks and intricate cabins of galleons like the Falchion and Gargoyle, the trim, blade-like hull of the Albatross. I used to despise junk-rigged ships. I thought they were the ugliest things afloat. Now I think that the Corsair has the sleekest and most aggressive silhouette of any ship in the game. Trade Lands features several NPC factions that influence the Grand Isles through politics and technology. The biggest of these is in Yola, which is literally just China. It's massive, it's populous, it invents junk rigged ships, and you'd theoretically have to sail to the very, very far east to reach it. And Yola sucks. All they do is try to annex islands and expand their empire. A lot like real life China. There's also Birkland, the most proximal outside faction of the Grand Isles and probably the most influential. It often fights proxy wars with the other large nations using the playable factions, and it remains the only NPC faction that you can actually visit. The Brashovian Federation is an antagonistic faction in the Far West. It's a highly industrialized nation that specializes in churning out ironclad warships and has a major city called Dresden. Oh yeah, they also build world-dominating super weapons. Prashovia is generally seen as the bad guy, and NPC ships in combat missions will fly their flag. Lesser NPC factions include Aokai, a mysterious tribe of raiders, and Kateria, a generic desert nation. Trade Lands leans very heavily on its Discord and other outside resources for the quote, full experience. A person can play for years and get the best ships, items, and levels, but if they aren't in the Discord, they lose access to the trading network, news on lore and game updates, pirate crews and navies, and other supplemental content. I'll end this segment by again stressing the investment placed in this game by its community. For every casual player, there's a fanatic who joins a trading company, navy, or pirate crew. While this is generally a good thing, there's definitely a bit of elitism that seeps into this part of the player base. I hesitate to use the word toxic, but sometimes it can be antagonistic jerks. Just be chill. Don't prey on new players when you're a high level. Don't rip people off when they don't know any better. Just be polite and cordial, even while you're stealing someone's cargo. In conclusion, it's probably impossible to approach this review with a complete lack of bias. Trade Lands has been one of my favorite Roblox games for longer than this channel has existed. Playing it now, even after a few years of absence, has proven that it's still just as enjoyable as it was when I was younger, which can't be said about many games that are laden with nostalgic memories. The game is fun, the community is active, and the updates keep flowing. What more could you really ask for? Trade Lands has earned itself a seaworthy 8 out of 10. Hey, Editing Skid here. I'm sorry for the months-long drought of videos. As my brother 713 Steam so pointedly informed me, even Jesus didn't fast that long. Honestly, it's a combination of schoolwork and the fact that Trade Lands was just so addictive that I was playing it instead of, you know, making videos about it. But hey, it all turned out okay. You know, it did come out. I might try and go a different direction in the near future with more of a gameplay focus than a, you know, analytical review type focus. But none of that set in stone 
known yet, so I'm not gonna get any deeper into it. Thank you all for watching the video. Like, subscribe, comment, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.